Welcome to the Civil Rights Training for the Child Nutrition Programs, presented by the Nebraska Department of Education Nutrition Services. This training will focus on civil rights for program participants that administer and participate in child nutrition programs, including the National School Lunch and Breakfast Programs, Child and Adult Care Food Program, and the Summer Food Service Program. The USDA requires that any program receiving federal financial assistance provide training to its staff on civil rights. Specifically, USDA requires that frontline staff who interact with program applicants or participants and those who supervise frontline staff are required to receive civil rights training. Training must be completed and documented on an annual basis. Training is required so that people involved in all levels of program administration understand civil rights, related laws, procedures, and directives. Civil rights refers to the rights of personal liberty guaranteed by the 13th and 14th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution and Acts of Congress, and to the fair and equitable treatment of all customers and employees. Discrimination occurs when the civil rights of an individual are interfered with because of their membership in a particular group or class. By the end of this training, you will be able to identify and implement civil rights procedures correctly, accommodate disabilities through reasonable modifications, establish or identify necessary updates for your program's civil rights procedure, and you will have completed annual civil rights training. Throughout this training, we will be covering the following topics, legislation and authority, assurances, public notification, data collection, language assistance, reasonable accommodations for persons with disabilities, complaint procedure and conflict resolution, training, and customer service. Let's begin by discussing legislation and authorities. Programs receiving USDA funds must follow civil rights regulation and policy to ensure benefits of the child nutrition programs are made available to all eligible people who participate in the program. The regulations that outline the SFA or institutions' responsibilities regarding civil rights compliance in the child nutrition programs listed on this slide are provided in FNS 113-1. The purpose of Civil Rights Instruction 113-1 is to establish and convey policy, provide guidance and direction to the USDA Food and Nutrition Service and its recipients and customers, and ensure compliance with and enforcement of the prohibition against discrimination in all FNS nutrition programs and activities, whether federally funded in whole or not. The following slides provide the authorities for the child nutrition programs. You may read more detail about each in FNS 113-1 dated 11-8-2005. This can be accessed through the link provided on this slide. Civil rights legislation over the years impacts your civil rights responsibilities. These laws and legal authorities guarantee rights for individuals to receive equal treatment and prohibit discrimination in a number of settings, including education, employment, housing, lending, voting, and more. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination based on race, color, and national origin in programs and activities receiving federal financial assistance. The Civil Rights Restoration Act of 1987 clarified the intent of Congress as it relates to the scope of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. All recipients of federal funds must comply with civil rights laws in all areas, 
not just the program or activity that receives funds. Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 prohibits discrimination from any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance based on sex. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 prohibit discrimination based on disability within any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. The Age Discrimination Act of 1975 prohibits discrimination based on age in programs or activities receiving federal financial assistance. USDA Regulation 7, Code of Federal Regulations, or CFR, Part 16, ensures equal opportunity for religious organizations to compete on an equal footing with other organizations for USDA assistance. USDA LEP, or Limited English Proficiency, Guidance and Executive Order 13166 requires recipients of federal financial assistance to provide meaningful access to LEP applicants and beneficiaries to prevent discrimination on the basis of national origin. The Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act of 1996 enforces Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and related statutes in block grant type programs. The Food and Nutrition Act of 2008, as amended, prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, sex, age, national origin, religion, political beliefs, or disability. In 7 CFR 15, the USDA is granted authority to develop civil rights requirements that prohibit discrimination in all programs or activities receiving federal financial assistance. This legislation also applies to the Food and Nutrition Services, or FNS, which is the administrator of the child nutrition programs within USDA. FNS provides specific guidance within FNS Instruction 113-1 and Appendix B for all programs and activities that receive either partial or full funding by USDA FNS. USDA Departmental Regulation 4330-002 ensures compliance with and enforcement of the prohibition against discrimination in programs and activities funded in whole or in part by the USDA. Now that we have reviewed civil rights legislation and authorities, let's take a look at the definition of discrimination. Discrimination is defined as different treatment which make a distinction of one person or a group of persons from others, either intentionally, by neglect, or by the actions or lack of actions based on a protected class. You may be asking, what is a protected class? A protected class refers to any person or group of people who have a characteristic for which discrimination is prohibited based on law, regulation, or an executive order. There are specific laws and regulations that provide for the six protected classes in food and nutrition service programs. These include race, color, national origin, sex, including gender identity and sexual orientation, age, and disability. Protected classes may vary somewhat between federal programs. For example, other federal programs may include the following protected classes, marital or family status, parental status, and protected genetic information. To qualify for federal financial assistance, the program application must be accompanied by a written assurance that the program or facility will operate in compliance with all civil rights laws and non-discrimination regulations. 
a civil rights assurance must be incorporated in all agreements between state and local agencies and their subrecipients. Vendor agreements and food service management company contracts must include an assurance of non-discrimination as well. In these situations, the program operator, such as the SFA or CACFP sponsor, is ultimately responsible for ensuring that the vendor or management company is in compliance with the civil rights requirements. It's important to understand that these assurances help clarify expectations, can eliminate and or prevent discrimination against applicants and participants, and can address the effects of past discrimination. Required assurances language may be found in FNS Instruction 113-1 Appendix B. Let's now discuss public notification. The purpose of public notification is to inform applicants, participants, and potentially eligible persons of program availability, their rights and responsibilities, the non-discrimination policy, as well as the procedure for filing a complaint. Each of these components must be included. The program availability component must inform applicants, participants, and potentially eligible persons of the availability of the program, along with steps necessary for participation. Applicants, participants, and potentially eligible persons must be informed of their program rights and responsibilities. All information materials and sources used to inform the public about FNS programs must contain the non-discrimination statement. This would include websites from the local education agencies, school food authorities, other subrecipients such as CACFP sponsors, and the state agency. Applicants and participants must be advised at the service delivery point of their right to file a complaint, how to file a complaint, and the complaint procedures. The state agency and subrecipients or child nutrition program sponsors must take the following actions to inform the general public, potentially eligible populations, community leaders, grassroots organizations, and other referral sources about FNS programs and applicable civil rights requirements through the public release or notification. Inform the general public that your SFA or institution participates in the child nutrition programs and that free and reduced meals are offered. Prominently display the and justice for all poster, which includes the USDA's non-discrimination statement and lists the USDA contact information for filing a complaint of discrimination. Other methods of notification include bulletins, letters, leaflets, brochures, the internet, or computer-based applications. The state agency and subrecipients or sponsors serving the public must also convey the message of equal opportunity in all photos and other graphics used to provide program-related information. Additionally, appropriate information must be provided in alternate formats for persons with disabilities and in the appropriate languages for persons with limited English proficiency, or LEP. Finally, the required non-discrimination statement must be included. So how exactly should the non-discrimination statement be utilized? At a minimum, the full non-discrimination statement should be included on, but not limited to, application forms, notification of eligibility or ineligibility, verification materials such as the verification notice and results letter, notice of adverse action form, the program's home webpage or a direct link to the full non-discrimination statement provided on the webpage, and public information, including program literature. Here, we see the full non-discrimination statement. 
the non-discrimination statement was updated in 2022 to be consistent with the Supreme Court's decision referred to as the Bostock Memo. This update prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, including gender identity and sexual orientation in all FNS programs. The full non-discrimination statement includes information on how to file a complaint of discrimination. State, local, and sub-recipients must post the non-discrimination statement in their offices and be included in full on all materials produced for the public. If the material or document is too small to permit the full statement, seen on the previous slide, from being included, the material must, at a minimum, include the USDA's shortened version, which is, this institution is an equal opportunity provider. The shortened version of the non-discrimination statement can be used on program menus, and it is not required to be printed on items such as cups, buttons, magnets, or pens when the size is impractical. Translated versions of the non-discrimination statement may be accessed via the web page shown on this slide. The And Justice for All poster must be displayed in a prominent location for all participants and potential participants. Posters may be ordered using the Material Order Request Form, which is available on the NDE Nutrition Services homepage. At the time this training was recorded, the poster displayed on this slide is the poster that NDE has available. Updated posters will be made available to all child nutrition program sponsors once available. Let's now discuss data collection. FNS headquarters and regional offices, state agencies, local agencies, and other subrecipients must provide for and maintain a system to collect ethnic and racial data in accordance with FNS policy. As a means of monitoring civil rights compliance, state agencies shall establish a system for the collection of racial and ethnic data of each person applying for and receiving benefits. The income application or household applications that are completed each year and submitted to the sponsor have a section for the household to identify their ethnic and racial data. Applicants should be assured that this information is required for and used solely for statistical purposes and has no bearing on benefit eligibility. This data should be collected at the point of application or alternatively, at the time of enrollment at a school, child care facility, etc. A key point that we want to make is that children are not to be surveyed. This data will be used to determine how effectively FNS programs are reaching potential eligible persons and beneficiaries, identify areas where additional outreach is needed, and assist in the selection of locations for compliance reviews and complete reports as required. Here we see the two question format for race and ethnicity data collection. The first question is based on ethnicity and respondents may select either Hispanic or Latino or not Hispanic or Latino. The second question is based on race and respondents can select one or more of the following. American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, Black or African American, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, or White. Next, let's discuss language assistance. Limited English proficiency, or LEP, is a term used for individuals who do not speak English as their primary language and have limited ability to read, speak, write, or understand English because of their national origin. Federal agencies and recipients must take reasonable steps to ensure meaningful access to their programs and activities for persons with LEP. 
failure to do so could be discrimination on the basis of national origin. Meaningful access can be accomplished through reasonable, timely, appropriate, and competent language services to individuals with LEP when accessing programs and services. The following factors should be considered when addressing LEP. The proportion or number of LEP persons likely to be encountered within the area serviced by the recipient. Frequency with which LEP individuals come in contact with the program. Nature and importance of the program, activity, or service provided. And resources available and their costs. Translation resources may be necessary. The free and reduced price meal benefit application and meal benefit income eligibility forms are available in several foreign language translations and may be accessed through the web page displayed on this screen. Translation of vital documents is required. However, other program materials may also require translation. When considering options for translation services, it is important to remember that applicants and participants cannot be asked to bring their own interpreters, nor should children be utilized as interpreters. A shortage of resources does not eliminate the translation requirement. Qualified, competent, and accurate language resources may include those listed on the screen. For example, a Spanish teacher could assist a household in completing an application, but would need to be trained on the importance of keeping all information received from the household confidential. It is of utmost importance that confidentiality requirements are well understood. On this slide, several resources related to LEP population data are provided and may be accessed through the web pages listed. Let's now shift our focus to reasonable accommodations for persons with disabilities. The definition of a disability is a person who has a physical or mental impairment which substantially limits one or more major life activity, has a record of such impairment, or is regarded as having such an impairment. Major life activities means functions such as caring for self, performing manual tasks, walking, seeing, hearing, speaking, breathing, learning, and or working. The Rehabilitation Act of 1973, specifically Section 504, prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in programs and activities that receive federal financial assistance. This includes the USDA's child nutrition programs since funding is received for meals, milk, snacks, and commodities. The ADA Amendment Act of 2008 expanded the definition of disability to include major bodily functions, which includes immune system, normal cell growth, digestive, bowel, and bladder functions, neurological, brain, and respiratory functions, circulatory, cardiovascular, endocrine, and reproductive functions. So what does this mean for child nutrition program operators? More participants may be included within the expanded de disability definition and more meal accommodations may result. Once again, reasonable accommodations must be made to ensure program access. Ensure that communication with individuals with disabilities is as effective as communication with other individuals. It is important that websites and online application systems are readily accessible and usable. Auxiliary aids and services should be provided as necessary to ensure program information and services are accessible. Additionally, Reasonable meal accommodations may be necessary. Physical accessibility to the meal service area is also crucial. We will discuss integrated settings in further detail in a few more slides.
Over the past several years, there has been a steady rise in the number of requests to accommodate participants with special dietary needs in the USDA's child nutrition programs. Child nutrition programs play an important role in serving participants with special food and or nutrition needs by providing food substitutions and or modifications to meals and or snacks. Documentation such as a medical statement or IEP is necessary and should be retained on file. Households cannot be charged additional costs or fees associated with special dietary accommodations. Additional training and resources on accommodating special dietary needs may be found on the NDE Nutrition Services webpage. Other helpful resources include the CDC Voluntary Guidelines for Managing Food Allergies in Schools and Early Care and Education Programs, as well as trainings available through the Institute of Child Nutrition or ICN. Under Section 504, child nutrition program operators should provide accommodations for individuals with a disability in the least restrictive and most integrated setting possible. Safety and risk of stigma must be balanced when developing accommodations. Food allergies are a prime example of this situation. While allergy-free tables, such as a nut-free table, are allowable, Participants may feel excluded or that this calls attention to their accommodation needs. When considering these options, the severity of a food allergy and the age of the participant may factor into the decision-making process. If designing seating charts based on such circumstances, make sure that these tables are not used or viewed as a quote-unquote punishment. Now let's discuss complaints of discrimination, complaint procedures, and conflict resolution. All complaints alleging discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, age, sex, including gender identity and sexual orientation, or disability, either written or verbal, signed or anonymous, must be processed within the time frame established by the USDA regulations and agreements. All SFAs and institutions must develop a written civil rights complaint procedure and implement this procedure. A person can allege that discrimination has occurred and file a complaint if they feel that they were denied benefits, they received delayed benefits, they were treated differently than others or were provided disparate treatment based on a membership in one or more of the protected classes. Complaints of discrimination must be filed within 180 days of the alleged act of discrimination and shall be accepted and forwarded to the USDA. Complaints may be written, verbal, or anonymous. While complaint forms may be developed by state agencies or subrecipients, the use of these forms cannot be a prerequisite for acceptance. The state and subrecipient agencies must maintain a separate civil rights complaint log. Keep in mind confidentiality is crucial and must be maintained. Complainants may choose to directly contact USDA with their complaint contact the Nebraska Department of Education or NDE Nutrition Services with their complaint, or they may notify the Child Nutrition Program sponsor of their complaint. Sponsors must forward all discrimination complaints they receive regarding child nutrition programs to NDE Nutrition Services within five working days. Civil rights complaints should include the following information, name, address and telephone number of the complainant unless submitting anonymously, the location and name of the organization or office, the nature of the incident or action, the names, titles, and business addresses of persons who may have knowledge of the discriminatory action, the date or dates during which the alleged discriminatory actions occurred, and the basis for alleged discrimination. 
An English and Spanish version of the USDA complaint form may be accessed through the links provided on this slide. When handling complaints, either the complainant or the sponsor may complete the form. The complaint should be entered on the civil rights complaint log. Refer the complaint immediately to the SFA's or sponsor's primary contact person and ensure that the complaint is reported to NDE Nutrition Services within five working days. The sooner you contact us, the better. All discrimination complaints must be documented in the Civil Rights Complaint Log. This log must be dated and kept for three years plus the current year, even if no complaints have been received. The Civil Rights Complaint Procedure, Complaint Log, and copies of complaint forms along with contact information for the Civil Rights Coordinator, need to be available at every site. Once again, remember that confidentiality is extremely important. It may be possible to avoid potential civil rights complaints with the use of conflict resolution techniques. Remain calm and ask about the situation, making sure to repeat it back to ensure understanding. Talk through the situation with the involved parties, as this may allow a resolution to be achieved. Seek leadership assistance or support if necessary. Now let's move on to compliance reviews and resolution of noncompliance. The compliance review is a component of the FNS management evaluation review process that is conducted on an ongoing basis for all FNS programs. The Civil Rights Review must examine the activities of the state agency, subrecipients, or local agencies to determine whether FNS programs are being administered in compliance with civil rights requirements. FNS regions are responsible for the review of state agencies, and state agencies are responsible for the review of subrecipients. The office performing compliance reviews must advise the reviewed entity and FNS of significant review findings and recommendations in writing. There are three types of compliance reviews, pre-award, routine or post-award, and special. In pre-award reviews, state agencies and subrecipients must comply with civil rights requirements prior to approval for federal financial assistance. Routine or post-award reviews are routinely conducted by FNS and state agencies based on FNS Instruction 113-1 and program-specific regulations and policies. Each of the components discussed within this training would be included as an area of review within a routine or post-award compliance review. A special compliance review may be scheduled or unscheduled and are completed to follow up on prior findings, to investigate reports of noncompliance by other agencies, media, or grassroots organizations, may be specific to an incident or policy, be based on a history of statistical underrepresentation of particular group or groups, and or as a result of a pattern of complaints of discrimination. Compliance reviews are meant to ensure that there are no separation in meal time, seating arrangements, serving lines, and eating areas on the basis of the six protected classes identified on this slide. Additionally, while compliance reviews are not limited to the following, these reviews seek to ensure that the program information and materials are accessible to all, that the And Justice for All poster is displayed in a prominent location, that correct use of the non-discrimination statement is being implemented, appropriate collection of race and ethnic data, Incorrectly denied meal benefit applications are not disproportionate to a particular group or group, and that reasonable modifications are made for individuals with disabilities. 
a factual finding that any civil rights requirement, as provided by law, regulation, policy, instruction, or guideline, is not being adhered to by a state agency, subrecipient, or local site, requires immediate action to achieve voluntary compliance. The date in which the reviewed entity is notified is the finding's effective date. An acceptable corrective action plan must be submitted, and failure to respond or correct the finding may result in suspension or termination of financial assistance. A voluntary resolution agreement is an agreement that recipients are willfully consenting to undertake remedial actions in order to address identified areas of noncompliance or if in violation of applicable civil rights laws and or regulations. The VRA may be between multiple parties, such as FNS, Civil Rights Division, the recipient or subrecipient, such as the state agency, SFA, or CACFP operator, and the program participant or complainant. In lieu of issuing a written compliance review report with findings, a VRA may be utilized to close out a civil rights compliance review at the discretion of FNS Civil Rights Division. Failure to respond or correct the areas of noncompliance may result in suspension or termination of financial assistance. Let's now review the requirements for civil rights training. Civil rights training is required so that people involved in all levels of administration of programs that receive federal financial assistance understand civil rights related laws, regulations, procedures, and directives. FNS Regional Office of Civil Rights and state agencies will be responsible for training state agency staff. State agencies are responsible for training local agencies such as SFAs, institutions, and child care providers operating child nutrition programs. Local agencies are responsible for training their subrecipients, including frontline staff. Frontline staff who interact with program applicants or participants and those persons who supervise frontline staff must be provided civil rights training on an annual basis. It is the responsibility of the Child Nutrition Program Sponsor to train all frontline staff annually. This includes all food service staff, staff responsible for reviewing or approving meal benefit applications and or completing verification, teachers responsible for breakfast in the classroom, or individuals responsible for CACFP meal service and program volunteers. New employees must receive training prior to involvement in program activity. Training must cover all aspects of civil rights compliance, including, but not limited to, collection and use of data, effective public notification system, complaint procedures, compliance review techniques, resolution of noncompliance, requirements for reasonable accommodations for persons with disabilities, requirements for language assistance for individuals with LEP, conflict resolution, and customer service. Completion of annual training is required to be documented and documentation should include the date or dates of training, the first and last name of each training attendee, their signatures, and a description of the topics covered. Ensure that each staff or volunteer is able to identify a civil rights complaint if received, that they know what to do if a complaint is received, and that they understand that it is a person's basic right to file a complaint of discrimination. Lastly, let's review some ways you can provide excellent customer service. While an individual should never be discouraged from filing a complaint of discrimination, sometimes complaints are related to customer service rather than being discriminatory. 
excellent customer service may help reduce complaints. First and foremost, ensure that all staff and volunteers understand that all participants, regardless of race, color, national origin, sex, including gender identity and sexual orientation, age, or disability, must be allowed equal opportunities to participate in child nutrition programs. Next, create a customer-focused culture or environment. Be polite and patient. Display excellent listening skills while avoiding interruptions. Respond to questions and provide additional resources if and when necessary. Treat all participants equally within all aspects of the program, not just those listed on this slide. Each time you interact with participants, applicants, or beneficiaries, ask yourself, how would I want to be addressed if the roles were reversed? Am I treating this person in the same manner as I treat others? How can I have a positive impact on this individual's day? We all know that a smile can do wonderful things, but so can asking about their day or creating conversation. When interacting with applicants or potentially eligible persons, ask yourself, have I provided this person with all the necessary program information? Have I informed this person of the information necessary to make a determination on an application? And have I given this person the opportunity to clarify all relevant factors or inconsistencies, as well as an opportunity to ask questions? To review, all civil rights laws, regulations, and policies described throughout this training must be adhered to. Additional civil rights resources can be found on the NDE Nutrition Services webpage. But in closing, we wanted to provide you a few key reminders for child nutrition program sponsors. Prominently display the AM Justice for All poster. Make sure to include the non-discrimination statement on all printed materials and offer meals and snacks to all eligible participants. Offer child nutrition programs in a non-discriminatory manner provide meaningful access to individuals with LEP, ensure that reasonable accommodations are provided for individuals with disabilities, train staff annually on civil rights, and finally, develop and fully implement a procedure for handling civil rights complaints, ensuring that all staff understand this procedure. Thank you for your participation in this training. Should you have any questions, please feel free to contact NDE Nutrition Services at 402-471-2488 or 800-731-2233 or via email at nde.nsweb at nebraska.gov.